Good morning. We're glad you're here, and I'll turn on my microphone. It's on. It's on. We are so glad that you made it, and um, it feels like a heat wave almost, doesn't it, compared to last Sunday? Somebody said, man, I just, I thought it was our bike rider, uh, said I couldn't make it last week. I was like, well, Steve, we understand. Where's Steve? We said, man. It was negative something, and the wind chill you would have created by yourself, you would have just been a Steve Sickle by the time you got here. <laughs> but I said, you know, there were about 50 or 60 other people that agreed with you that he- had heated cars. <laughs> there really were. All right, hey, just real quick, the Stroms, uh, Jeremy, Jill, Mason, Carly, and Kara have, have joined our congregation, and uh, a couple of those kiddos will be... Uh, baptized uh, next few weeks from now, okay? And you'll see their faces and names on the, on the family tree that's growing outside on the hallway, just outside the right hall or wall as you leave the worship center. Divorce Cares changed, uh, changed nights and going to meet on Tuesday, Tuesday night, January 13th, beginning January 13th at 7 p.m. We have a special called business meeting for the election of a deacon, uh, January 18th. Uh, next Sunday to be considered, and that uh, person is Todd Fisher. And the last thing I'll just announce to you real quick is this year for our Super Bowl Sunday party, and Super Bowl is spelled S-O-U-P-E-R because copyright infringement, they're really persnickety about using their name. Uh, We will be having, we've invited Journey Church uh, to join us for our Super Bowl chili cook-off. So there's more, one thing that means, and I like this part, is there's more chili to try. So uh, we do have a contest, and um, we uh, are, are inviting you to be a part of that. And it, you don't get anything fancy. You get your name inscribed on an old chili pot, okay? But it is bragging rights for a whole year, and we love to promote pride and bragging at Covenant. <laughs> no, we don't. So please, please be here. Look forward to that. It's February 1st, kind of early this year, I think. That seems early for the Super Bowl to me. It's usually about the second week in February. But anyway, please be here. Uh, We have times and dates on the website and in your bulletin. The last thing I'll tell you, I told you that was the last thing, but I am a preacher and I've always, that usually means second to third thing. And uh, that is, if you would take your uh, worship bulletin and fill that out, pull your uh, bulletin, your worship tear off, please use that to communicate with us anything you want to communicate with us. Prayer needs, Uh, opportunities that you're looking to serve or opportunities that we might have that you want to connect with, uh, anything at all. We'd love for everybody to fill that out and just put it in the worship, in the offering plate. We can also check attendance by that, not by name, but by number. We kind of validate uh, through that. So if you want to do that, it'd be a great help. All right. And so uh, let me see. I've got to get my sermon manuscript right here. As we uh, find it helpful quite honestly, to break things up every now and then, and uh, we are going to go back to, for a few weeks, uh, preaching the message, sharing the message, and then re-engaging and responding to the message through music. So today, we're going to kind of re-engage that for a little bit, and we want to ask you to just, I know when we do things differently, it can be kind of, can feel awkward, and quite honestly, quite honestly, that's our goal, is it needs to sometimes feel a little bit awkward. You ever do anything uh, on autopilot in your life, and you don't realize you've even done it until somebody maybe points it out, that's the last thing we want to happen in a worship service. We want you to know uh, exactly what we're doing, and we want you to do it on purpose. Okay, so let's just stop and pray. Would you pray with me just for a moment? Father, we, uh, we sit here today not because uh, we think that, that coming here and sitting down is going to earn us points with you. That's not why we're here. God, we sit here today because there's a real distinct possibility, even a likelihood, that we could meet with you. It may be in the lyric of a song. It may be in the handshake and the smile of a friend or someone we've just met. It may be in the encouraging word from the message or, uh, again, from somebody else. It could be in a prayer. It could be in the act of giving. But, God, we want to leave here knowing that we've been in your presence and not in just the presence of people. We love each other. We're learning to love each other even better and to love the world around us. But the greatest, greatest reality today is not just that we love each other, but that you love us. Make that known and make it manifest in our presence today. We ask you to speak with authority and with power in Jesus' great name. Amen. I heard a song by Need to Breathe. I'm not going to play the video. It's, it's pretty long. Uh, it's called Difference Maker. And it's kind of a story that chronicles... Uh, 
their struggle as a band, as a Christian rock band, that uh, they were going through after they toured with Taylor Swift, and they wanted to, to, they just felt empty, and they felt like they weren't hitting the mark with where they needed to hit the mark, and uh, basically the story uh, in, the, in the title is Difference Maker. They wanted to actually make a difference. They wanted to meet with God in such a way that their music would make a difference and not just entertain people. Making a difference matters. I think everybody wants their life to make a difference. I think everybody has that within them. Everybody has that desire. Everybody has that potential as well. And so as a church, we're encouraging, and we're, we're maybe that's too light of a word, we're strongly encouraging people to engage a lifestyle. We would call it a missional lifestyle. Missional is nothing more than a life that is on a mission, life being w- lived with a sense of mission and purpose that we would engage this acronym called BELLS. It's a lifestyle change. It's not just a habit-forming thing. It's, it's something that changes our perspective. It changes the way we see people. It changes the way we see ourselves. And it definitely, definitely changes how people experience us. The acronym is BELLS. And I'm going to ask you to forgive me because literally I pretty much uh, rewrote this message this morning. I didn't rewrite it from scratch. I had some help from input from elders and other leaders and I just felt like we needed to go a little bit of a different direction. And so instead of trying to hodgepodge the uh, PowerPoint in there, I just ask you to just follow along with me audibly and just auditorily today and listen with me. But we'll we'll have the scripture up there. So we're talking about becoming a blessing. And the acronym is BELLS, Blessing Others, Eating or Engaging Other People, Learning to Listen to the Holy Spirit, Learning Jesus, and living a sent life, B-E-L-L-S. Blessing, eating, learning, listening, and sent. All right? That is, those are the the aspects of a life that's being lived on mission for Jesus. That's a life that makes a difference instead of being a consumer Christian. That a consumer Christian is nothing more than a person who says, basically, what's in this for me? That is, what's in the church for me? What benefit do I get out of it? So when that mentality is embraced, when the consumer mindset is Embrace people leave churches for the craziest reasons. I've known of people who would leave churches simply because of the time that the church met. I, I, I've literally known of people who met and then decided that they would they would go to a church that had differing theology, but the music they preferred. So they would compromise theology, but they wouldn't compromise music. The only way somebody who knows better makes a crazy decision like that is when they're a consumer. Primarily, what's in it for me? I go to church because of what I get out of it. I involve myself because of what I get out of it. What we're asking you to do and become as a congregation of people is to flip that inside out, is to be the service of the community, to be those who serve the community, to think first of how can I engage the community, how can I bless the community, how can I help our community and impact our community. Yesterday, um, we had a mix-up at the pharmacy at Dillon's, and uh, the lady was, we should say, slightly snippy on the phone with my wife, uh, even to the point where my uh, 18-year-old is not normally sensitive to that kind of stuff, too easily offended, was kind of shocked as he could hear her over the phone, and uh, it was just the strangest thing. It was really over a $3 thing that they should have, $3, seriously, and they should have just comped us that, and long story short, is they were not thinking of the customer first. They just weren't thinking of us first. They were thinking of them first. And when a company or a business does that, it kind of makes me want to pull back. And I think that the church today has a little bit of that reputation, maybe a lot, in our community where the community might want to pull back and say, well, the church is always wanting something from me. They want to consume from me. They want me to do something for them rather than how is the church engaging us and as a community? Uh, we're being challenged to do this because we don't, not because we think it's a great growth strategy or, or it's going to bring lots of people in. I think it will have a dynamic impact on our, on our spiritual and numerical growth, but that's not why we're doing it. Being challenged to become a church family that, that blesses other people, engages people, listens to the Holy Spirit, learns Jesus, and lives a sent life because that's what it means to be a Jesus follower. That's the bottom line of what it means to be a Jesus follower. 
And so we don't expect somebody, I'm not expecting somebody to go from zero to 90 today to say, I'm, I, I don't even know about Jesus. I'm here as a seeker. I'm just opening my mind to the possibility of having a relationship with God and that all of a sudden you become this super, you know, missional Christian. We're not expecting that. There are all kinds of steps that people can take. And we're going to walk through these steps together. And today we're just going to look at the first step. And I want you to just open your mind to this possibility of you becoming a person who could bless other people consistently and do it on purpose. Now, the idea between, behind a spiritual discipline like this is that you do it on purpose with intentionality for long enough so that it becomes a habit. Now, I pushed back on George Bajakli, who's kind of mentoring me through this process and talking to me and formulating these ideas with me and with Nate. And one of the things I've pushed back on is, I don't know that I want it to be a habit. A habit is something you do mindlessly and without thought. And he said, exactly. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, if picking your nose is a habit in public, that's probably a bad thing, right? If you're buried up to the first knuckle in a movie theater and everybody's looking at you and you're going, that's just, you know, that's a bad habit. But if you bless people just because it's second nature, you don't even have to think about it. Isn't that cool? Isn't that good? It doesn't, it doesn't or, or, or bring a lack of credibility to it all when you bless people just because it's second nature. You don't even think about it. It's just who you are. And that's what he's getting at. So we want to move in that direction. It won't happen overnight. But listen, church, when it happens, it's going to be a shockwave in Topeka, Kansas. If the, if the couple hundred people who are affiliated with the congregation at Covenant Baptist Church would truly become missionally minded lifestyle people, It'll, it'll rock our world. Mark Russell wrote, uh, wrote The Missional Entrepreneur, and he, and he tells of two teams of missionaries that went to Thailand, kind of as an experiment, not necessarily, but they did monitor these two teams. Now, for the sake of simplicity, but this is accurate, we'll call the two teams the blessers and the evangelist or the converters. Okay, so they had two mission teams sent to Thailand, and the first team, the blessers, were just going to go, and their strategy was to be a blessing to people, to just bless the community and serve the community. And the second one would be a more traditional approach. The converters would be a more traditional approach to evangelism. That is, they would begin to preach and teach and tell people the gospel on the front end and begin to try to convert people in terms of their beliefs on the front end. The interesting thing is is the blessers uh, went with the intention of blessing people. They would say, I'm here to bless, to bless whoever comes my way, or I just want to be a blessing to the community. And the converters went with the sole intention of converting and evangelizing everyone around them. You would think, just lo logically, you would think that the converters would have seen more people profess faith in Christ. The study followed both teams for a couple years, not just for a few weeks, but for a couple years, Two inter interesting observations. The blessers had a greater social impact than the converters. That is, the social context that they lived in was impacted to a far to greater, greater degree by those who were, went as blessers. And that proved that the blessers' intention of blessing people in the community around them resulted in some social dynamics that were positive, tremendous amounts of, of social betterment and social good. And the surprising, even, maybe even the more surprising thing is they discovered the blessers also, also had almost 50 times as many people professing faith in Jesus as the converters. Isn't that amazing? That is, as an, if you just want to look at it as an outreach or an evangelistic strategy, which it's not, it's a lifestyle, but just monitoring the impact, a greater social impact, they were more invested and um, valued by the community, the blessers were, and 50 times more people came to faith through the blessers than the converters. So 50 people to one person. Isn't that amazing? Almost unthinkable in, in many times in respects to the, the thought processes of, of people in uh, church growth strategies today. I want you to look in your Bibles today to Genesis chapter 12. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. Here's the deal. Is that blessing others is not a new thought. 
Blessing other people on purpose is not a new thought. It is central to God's economy. That is his way of doing things and advancing his kingdom and his causes and his purpose. Listen, blessing has been central to it from day one. Would you stand today and let's read this together, all right? Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses. Here's what it says. I think we got that. We sure do. If you can't, don't have your Bible with you today, it's on our screen. And here's what the scripture says. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Amazing. Pray with me just a quick. Father, even as I read that again, I'm just struck at the centrality and how crucial and how important, how pivotal it is to be a blessing. To know you and to follow you, to become like you, is going to mean inevitably that we bless people that we are blessings, that we live lives marked by that. Help us to do it today as a congregation. Turn that corner for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Did you see that? All the statements. He says this. We're not going to go into this long. But when God was beginning the entire mission of saving and rescuing humanity, when God started the, the missional effort of redemption, of uh, of providing salvation for people who were lost and broken by sin. That's you and I. When God started that whole process and inaugurated it on earth, he started it and built it upon and marked it by the principle of blessing. It's not arguable. It's not even hard to pull out of here, is it? He starts off and he says, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Now you can Let me just track this for you. Abraham, who was Abram, was going to be the father of the nation of Israel. Israel, and this is skipping a lot of steps, but Israel was the nation through which the Messiah would come. So Jesus came through Israel. Israel came from Abraham. So this is God starting the whole process. He says, Abraham, I'm going to bring the Messiah through you, and here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. So it starts with God blessing Abraham. And then he says, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Abraham, I'll bless you, and you will be a blessing. So God would bless Abraham. Abraham would become a blessing to others. So you can already see the, the, the way this flows. It flows into a person's life, and it flows out and blesses others. And it's such an important principle. God said this, I will bless those who bless you. God said to Abraham, Abraham, this is so important that when somebody blesses you, I will bless them. If somebody does curses you, I'll curse them. And then he finishes up saying, all people on earth will be blessed through you. Now, you could pull this out, and I don't think it's very hard to do, and I don't think it's a lack of integrity to the scriptures. When it says all people on earth will be blessed through you, you could say that's a type of who we are and what we ought to be, that the peoples on this earth, the people, the nations of this earth ought to be blessed through us. All right, so that's a simple explanation of a pretty profound part of our story as Christians. And it's simple because it's simple. There's no, I don't need to make it complicated to make myself sound smart because that's, that's a lot of work anyway. This is a very, very simple principle. God works in the economy, in the realm of blessing, and it works like this. God blesses a person, a person blesses others, others begin to bless back, and it works back around and it begins to spread and multiply in a, in a tr tremendous, tremendous way. So to bless, here, let's talk about what it means. The word blessing has a lot of different connotations, but you really need to put them all together to understand because there's different ways to do this and different uh, angles of what it means to be a blessing. So it can mean to come alongside of someone to give them strength on the journey. And, and if I were to pick a definition that just kind of covered it all, this would be it. To come alongside of somebody, to strengthen or encourage them on a journey of life, to strengthen their arms, to support them in an hour of weakness, to provide strength or help when they don't have the strength themselves to do it. Maybe by saying the right thing, it may be by doing the right thing, and it may be by giving the right thing. That is, we bless in three primary ways with our words, 
with our actions and with gifts. And, and it helps other people live better. Here's the cool thing, is that when you bless somebody, you're helping them live better, to live stronger, to live a brighter and more hopeful life, and to see that there is a better way. And we can do that for people, and that kind of behavior uh, always raises questions. This is not the economy of our culture. This is not how our culture works. Okay, This is not just going to weave itself seamlessly into into Topeka, Kansas, because in our culture, it's still survival of the fittest. In our culture, it's still uh, what's in it for me and how can I raise myself up above other people. And blessing means I serve other people and I help them advance their cause. That's what blessing means. Blessing does cost us, but it doesn't deplete us. I would ask you to remember that. Blessing is always going to cost you something. Because it's a giving of yourself, of your time, of your words, of your energy, of your emotions. It always costs you, but when you're blessing others, it doesn't deplete you. So basically, living as a blesser is a way of demonstrating that we love our neighbor and that we love God. And it's a visible, tangible, very, very clear way that we demonstrate that. We never outgrow the need for blessing. Children need blessings, adults need it, and I need it, and you need it. We all do. So does your neighbor, so does your coworker, so does your enemy, and so does your best friend. Blessings are so important that God himself, God himself enjoys blessings. The psalmist says, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And many times throughout the psalms, we're encouraged and admonished to bless God. And the only takeaway from that is that God himself enjoys being blessed. Doesn't need it, enjoys it. Blessings so important as a testimony of God's goodness and who he is and what he's like. He entrusts us to do it even when our enemies attack us. In 1 Peter, there's a passage, and it is the one I was going to really preach out of, but he talks about this, that when others insult you, bless them in return. Not as a high road of snooty spiritual superiority or to make yourself look good and to make them, but the best way to counter toxicity and harm and anger in a venomous spirit, the best way to turn the whole situation around is to bless in return, no matter what. So God would have us even bless our enemies, church. Not just the waitress at, at the restaurant, not just your male person, not just your neighbor, not just your best friend. But God would even have us bless our enemies. That's how powerful it is to bless other people. And the simplicity of what it means to be a blessing, you're going to see, is just almost mind-boggling. And you would almost think that it couldn't be as powerful as it is, as simple as it is, because there's not a person in this room, no matter your age, no matter your, your socioeconomic standing in life, no matter your education or your affluence or your lack of affluence or, your, or your, your job history or your future, no matter what, everybody can do this with equal impact. Everybody can do this because it, that's just the nature of how God works. He's given us that. We live in this world that's hostile to this, and so it does raise question when we live this way, especially when we live this way habitually. It won't make a difference if we just all get boosted up and, and kind of pumped up to go be a blessing for a week. Now, it'll be nice for some people if everybody in here goes out and starts blessing others, but we're talking about a lasting impact of a congregation of people who is embedded in a culture in Topeka, Kansas, saying we're going to live here differently, and we're going to consistently be and learn how to become even better and better blessings to our community and those people that live around us. So let me do this. Let's go through three ways in which we can bless other people, which we can actually do this. And let's not just talk about and just it's easy for me to sit up here and say, hey, go be a blessing uh, to other people. So what does that look like for you this week in your life, in your context, where in the people that you know, in your relationships, everywhere you're going, how can you be a blessing to others knowing the potential impact of living a life this way? All right? So the first example is, is to bless someone with words. Now, there was never, never a greater example of being a blessing than Jesus, right? That goes without saying. But many times we miss the fact that he used his words to bless other people. And I'm not just talking about saying, hi, how are you doing? You look nice today. But speaking truthfully and honestly with love and grace into people's lives. When there was a woman who was caught in adultery. And she was brought to Jesus and thrown down in front of her. And the, the Pharisees had said, you know, the law says to stone her. What do you say? And, and Jesus goes through this whole kind of uh, 
methodology. He writes in the, in the dirt, and he's asking questions maybe. We don't know what he's writing, actually. And finally, this is the story when Jesus stands up and says, Whoever is without sin, you cast the first stone. Well, from the oldest to the youngest, everybody dropped their stones. The woman who had been caught in adultery, who thought she had faced and incurred the penalty or the curse of stoning to death. They didn't just stone you so it hurt. They stone, they were, she thought she was about to die. So she's in a moment when she thinks she's about to die. And Jesus speaks to these people saying, if you're without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. Everybody leaves. Jesus asks her, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Those words, it would be impossible, absolutely impossible for me to overstate the impact they had to have on that woman. Can you imagine thinking your moments from death? But only through the spoken words of Jesus, the whole thing turns around, and not only are you spared, but you're blessed and set free. That's what happened. It changed her world. Hey, it didn't just happen back in the Bible times. It happened to me just about two months ago, and I've been blessed many more times than this, but this was so significant I wanted to share with you that a, a pastor and, and mentor and a friend of mine reconnected with me a couple months ago at a time when I was just really going through some struggles and some hard times and some vision issues and, and difficulties, not this kind of vision, but seeing what God's up to in the world vision. Uh, I do have this kind of vision problem too. If you notice, I hold things further than I used to. He sat me down. And he just began to speak blessing into my life. I mean, he began to say things he had no idea of their, their impact. He wasn't really trying to be a blessing. He wasn't actually, he, he was just speaking into my world. Words of blessing. It turned my world around that day. It turned my perspective. It changed everything. Just his words. It really truly blessed me. And it had a marked difference on my ministry and my life. We need to be mindful all the time what people say to us and what we say to other people and, 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 and how we are presenting ourselves in word. I am terrible at this so many times, especially in my home where I'm very comfortable and I just kind of, I can say things flippantly, I can say things snidely and uh, my words are not always a blessing and I want my words to be a blessing. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a serious deal, but the other day we were just kidding around and we were can I use Carson's favorite son example? You won't bother you. Won't. We were sitting around and we were just saying, Kelly and I kind of both joined in and we were saying, you know, Carson, he's like the model little brother. Mom, huh? Mom left the room. It was just me. Thanks. I was going to throw mom under this bus too, but you're not helping me here. You be quiet. This is my sermon. <laughs> you sing, I preach. Carson was, and Carson is a good little kid. I mean, he's really kind of, he's the peacemaker child. He's kind of the middle child you know, lets everybody be happy. Um, and, and I just started yanking chains and saying, you know, Carson really is. He's our favorite son. I mean, he, what does he ever do wrong? I mean, he doesn't do anything wrong. And he, you're like, well, y'all, you used to spank us. You never spanked him. I was like, he doesn't ever do anything. He needs a spanking. For you, you needed a whooping every other day. I still need to beat you every now and then. No, I'm teasing. But we just started doing that and teasing and uh, I thought, and it was obvious, it was, it was obvious that we were just kidding, but I just started thinking about words, and that in a moment when things weren't perfect, those words of mine could echo in my son's, Braden and Tanner's heads, to project an unintended message that somehow parents, we need to be careful with our words, by the way, I reconciled that, and you know, they laughed and said, Dad, we, we know, of course. And I think Tanner said, we all know that I'm the favorite son. So it didn't, <laughs> it didn't really have a negative impact. Did you say that? Yeah, yeah I think you did. Yeah, he said, <laughs> yeah. I said. <laughs> so be careful with our words. We can speak tremendous blessing into other people. When I went to Dylan's to follow up with the snide phone call comment, uh, I tried to end that with a blessing. I said, you know what? As the pharmacist apologized, and we just had a crummy week, I said, you know what? I know it's a hard job, and uh, we just want to have a good relationship and be an encouragement. So hope this, hope this is not a big deal. 
and just try to let my words flow to be a blessing to that person. Who do you know that could use a word of blessing this week in your life? Is there someone where you work, the Holy Spirit may be prompting you to speak to somebody in your family, a neighbor or a coworker, maybe somebody that's at odds with you? Ask the Holy Spirit. Ask God's Spirit to give you a word to say to them. Maybe it's a child or a spouse or a teller at the bank, a grocery store clerk. Maybe you write it on a note. could be Facebook, could be text, Twitter, Instagram. Any way that you can use your words, you can begin to bless other people. But you can do it with your actions, too, or with deeds. And maybe this is one of the most common ways that people bless other people in, in actions. There's a cool story in the Scriptures when uh, Jesus is teaching and he's in a person's house. And there's these men who have a friend who's paralyzed. And they want to get their friend in front of Jesus, but the crowd is so big that the room is so packed, they cannot get this pallet, which they're carrying this man on, they can't get him in through the door to Jesus. So they climb up on the roof, a flat roof, and they take off some tiles, and they literally lower this man down in front of Jesus. And a lot happens in this story, a whole lot happens. And Jesus basically said, your sins are forgiven. That's the first thing he did. It's kind of, it's, it's not funny, but it's kind of ironic funny that these men had in mind, we're going to bring our friend to Jesus, we're going to lower him down in front of Jesus, and Jesus is going to help him walk. And Jesus kind of, it's probably anticlimactic for them, actually, when he says, your sins are forgiven. And he looks up and says, that's great, but I still can't walk. Now, Jesus uses other circumstances, and the people who are looking on, who get mad and say, well, only, only God can forgive sins, and Jesus is like, right, exactly. Well, they can't prove. How do you prove that somebody has their sins forgiven? Well, in, in, in Jewish thought and mindset is, is that a curse, that would be a curse to not be able to walk, or paralysis was an affliction from God based on sin. So the only way you could prove that sin had been forgiven is if the person was physically cured of the ailment that brought, in their mind that was brought on by sin. So Jesus said, it's easy to say your sins are forgiven and it's a, lot, it's a lot harder to say, get up and walk. And, the guy, and then Jesus told the guy, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he did. There's a lot of blessing and actions there. First of all, Jesus blessed this guy with the gift of restored physical capabilities as well as blessed him with forgiveness of his sins. His friends blessed him by carrying. Instead of coming up to the door and going, man... It's too crowded. We aren't going to get you in there today. The situation was too serious, too desperate. So they, they literally blessed their friend by carrying him all the way through the roof to get to Jesus. Listen, I, I put out an um, email this week asking for examples of these kinds of blessings. And I got a lot of stuff back. In fact, I just couldn't really choose just one. But it's a neat thing to see how many people are blessing other people in our congregation indeed. You know, I just heard a story before we were before the service started where we had a church member who had a lot of stuff that had to get moved from behind their house. The city ordinance was, was causing the city to, to co cause a little hardship for him. And uh, a phone call or two were made and three or four church members showed up and, and just took care of it. And he was saying what a blessing it was. It was not just the blessing was just getting rid of the stuff but the affirmation that, that, that we're loved and we're a part of a community that cares about us and it will be there for us. It's huge, just huge. There's also blessing others with gifts. Some people are very, very naturally good at this and they do it almost without thought. And we have several of those people in our congregation. There's the man um, who was, uh, who was at, at the pool of Bethesda and he, was, he too was paralyzed for years, for 38 years. And the story goes that, that any time an angel would come and stir the waters, that whoever was the first person to get into that pool would be healed. And for years and years, this man had never been able to get there, right? Because he can't walk. Somebody always got ahead of him. Can you imagine sitting there that long until Jesus comes along and causes him to be able to walk? For 38 years, no one blessed him by carrying him to that pool. In a moment, his life changed by the one man named Jesus who blessed him with a gift of being able to get up and walk. 
It happens in our congregation pretty naturally too. Not in response to this message because this was long before then, but we had a, we had a church member who was just going through a hard time. Uh, family circumstances were difficult. Life had been weighing down and bearing down. And uh, just out of the blue, it, apparently out of the blue, it seemed out of the blue, it was definitely the orchestration of the Spirit. Uh, another church member came up and gave this, this woman a gift, just almost seemingly spontaneously. And there was no way for the one who is giving the blessing to know all of the impact that blessing was going to have on the recipient. But it was a lot more than the gift. It spoke into her world and breathed new life and encouragement. It's, remember our definition? It strengthened this lady. The gift did a lot more than, than, than add something to material to her life. It added encouragement, hope, and strength, and affirmation. It was absolutely unpredictable how profound and powerful the blessing was. You know, blessing others is not an obligation. It's really, really not. Because the people who do this already will tell you that the joy and the strength and the blessing they get out of being a blessing, just like the scripture said, it's more blessed to give or to bless others than it is to receive or consume blessings. It's amazing. Maybe somebody has offended you. Maybe there's somebody you know in our church who needs to hear or, or overhear that God forgives them. Maybe there's a waiter that needs an extra tip. Maybe there's a son or a daughter that needs a word of encouragement. Maybe there's a, a person who you're at odds with that needs the blessing of your forgiveness. I want you to know that if we'll practice this, if we'll just adopt this, it's so simple, of taking opportunities to be a blessing, it will change the world that we live in and the world that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Don't forget the tremendous blessings that have marked your life. I would ask you just for a moment, just for a, a brief moment to stop and think, of all the blessings that marked your journey up until this point. Family, people that love you, provisions that have been made, prayers that have been answered, gifts that have been given, relationships that have been formed and established, experiences that, that you've had, all kinds of things, all the blessings that have been poured into your life. Just like Abraham, when God called Abraham and said, I will bless you greatly. Don't forget all of the things that have marked your life up until this point. But don't you dare forget, don't you dare forget that God has not called you just to be blessed, but to be a blessing. As Abraham had to turn around, didn't have to, but he said, the inevitable product of me blessing you, God said, Abraham, is that you will be a blessing to all the nations. I'm going to ask you to begin to do this on purpose, to be a blessing to all the nations around you. And don't forget the last thing, that Abraham was blessed. He said, you will be blessed by all people. Remember when I said, blessings are always cost you something, but they'll never deplete you? In God's economy, when we give, he can give more. It's not an accumulation strategy of getting more. Because when we are free with the blessing God gives us, God is free to give us more. We have to empty some of the stuff to make room for more, but not to keep, but to give. And somehow, in that way of doing things, everybody begins to share in the blessings and the favor and the joy of God. I want to tell you that blessing other people is a joyful, God-favoring, soul-satisfying way of life. Consuming will kill you. If you go through life as a consumer, you consume in relationships, you consume products, you consume time, you consume talents, you consume everything around you. If you're a taker and a taker and taker, you'll never be satisfied. You begin to give and you begin to bless other people. It'll mark you and change. Here's what I want you to do. I want to ask you to write down the names of three people. I want you to write them down on the back of your hand. I don't care. You can write them on uh, the, the back of the bulletin, write them in the cover of your Bible. But I want you to write down at least start to think about, but, but if you can, write down the three names of three people that maybe the Holy Spirit is leading you to bless this week. Maybe they've already come to your mind as we've talked about this. Like I said, maybe it's somebody you've had conflict with or maybe somebody that you know has a need that you could meet, but you've just not wanted to give up the time or the treasure or the talent to do that, but now you do. 
knowing that it'll cost you, but it'll never deplete you. Who could you bless this week? Who could you begin to truly speak life or give life or serve in a way that, that adds life to them? I want you to write down those names. Before you leave this place, at least write one. If you could write three, write three. God's way of changing the world, the world that's getting further from the church, is not a marketing strategy. It's not a better show. It's not more money thrown at it. It's not more talented speakers or musicians. God's way of changing the world is for the people who are of God to go live as a blessing to those around them. Isn't that different than being a converter? Doesn't that change the way you can go into your workplace tomorrow if you say, you know what? I don't have to argue someone into Jesus. I can begin to bless them. You know, this series is called what? Living a Questionable Life. You begin to bless people habitually, I promise you they're going to start asking questions. And then, as the scripture says, you can be ready to give an account of the hope that is in you that we find in Jesus. Remember the story that I started with? Fifty people to every one came to faith in Jesus, to those who blessed versus those who saw themselves as converters. Church, I want you to hear me. We're closing. We're not asking you to be converters. We're asking you to go be a blessing to the community that you live in. Be ready to explain the gospel if you're asked. But your job, your job and your role is to be a blessing. Let's pray together. Father, today we, um, we stop and we say thank you. For the great gifts you've given us. Would you make us become the kind of people who naturally bless as we go through life? Because we want to be a people that represents Jesus well. Because Jesus, you came and you died and you saved us through your death and your resurrection. And we love you now because you loved us first. Make us become a blessing. It is in Jesus' great name we pray. Amen.